Right, my name is Tamara Paramur, um, and I earn my wage at UJ, um, where I'm an economist and senior researcher um, at the Center for Competition, Regulation, and Economic Development. Welcome back. Um, I hope you all had a pleasant lunch. Um, and now we move into the next session, um, which explores the possible effect of a national minimum wage on all sectors of the South African economy. So basically what we'll be doing is looking at the historical trends in the labor market, and then also assess the potential impact of different minimum wages on various sectors of the economy and various types of workers. At the beginning of the session, I think it was Nicolau who said um, that some of the objectives of this initiative include ensuring that the contributions are rigorous um, and really evidence-based. And I think you'll see that the work that will be presented in this session really speak to this objective. So it's with great pleasure that we welcome Arden Finn and Asghar Adalzadeh to present their findings on the key trends in the South African labor market and the possible impact of minimum wage. I would just like to take this opportunity to introduce both the speakers and the discussant, and then I'll hand over to Arden. Okay, Arden is a researcher at Saldru. He holds a BCom Honours from UCT and an MSc in Economics for Development from Oxford. He's currently working on his PhD at UCT, and his research focuses on economic mobility in South Africa. His other research interests include labor economics and the economics of education, poverty, and inequality. He'll be presenting the results from a really great, yeah, you should read it, um, descriptive statistics paper that he wrote for this project. Ashgar is um, director and chief economic modeler at Applied Development Research Solutions, and I'll just say ADRS from now on. Um, in his over 25 years experience in economic modeling, he's built large scale models with user friendly web interfaces. And really the intention is to allow policymakers and analysts to design and assess the impact um, of policy choices, right, and produce projections. Um, he's built um, ADRS's macro, micro, and prov provincial economic models of South Africa. Um, and his latest model is um, a linked macro education model built for forecasting um, demand and supply of occupations and skills, and that's part of a DHET um, program. He has served as project director at UNU Wider, senior economic modeler and research director, director at the National Institute for Economic Policy, a senior lecturer, lecturer at WITS, and senior policy advisor at UNDP South Africa. He's also written extensively on macroeconomic, monetary, and fiscal policy, poverty eradication, employment creation, and economic modeling. Um, and he'll be presenting the results um, of the statistical modeling undertaken as part of this project. Um, and then finally, our discussant is um, Mike Rogan, who's a senior researcher in the Neil Agate Labor Studies Unit at Rhodes University, it's my university. <laughs> uh, and then he holds a PhD and a master's degree from UKZN. Um, over the far, um, past five years, he's focused largely on the application of statistical and econometric approaches to understanding income, poverty, unemployment, and health um, within South Africa. And his research interests include gender, employment, informal work, health, poverty, inequality, and evaluation methodologies. Okay, so I'll hand over to Arden. Great, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to all of you for being here to engage in this uh, policy debate, and particularly to the organizers. Uh, thank you uh, very much for this opportunity to have such a, an extended and meaningful engagement with one another on, on, on this very important topic. Also, uh, thank you for spending more than the national minimum amount on lunch, because that was really a good, a good half an hour session of eating. Um, it's wonderful to be back in my original home, uh, from my adopted home in, in Ethiopia. And it's also, again, wonderful to be part of a vibrant uh, policy debate because I can assure you there's not too much debate on minimum wages taking place in Addis Ababa right now. Uh, so I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Um, let's get started. We're running a little bit late, so I'll try to be as uh, concise as, as uh, I can be uh, over the course of my slides. Um, just the outline of what I'm going to talk about uh, in the next 20 to 30 minutes is just a, a motivation for, no, I haven't left thing. I'll, I'll keep it up anyway. Just a motivation for, for why this type of uh, very simple descriptive statistics of the South African labor market is a, is a useful undertaking. 
Um, and then I'll talk about, uh, in, a, in two or three slides, the role of wages in determining household income, poverty, and inequality uh, in South Africa. Um, then there's one slide on the, uh, oh, sorry, then there's a, a section on the current state of the labor market, a focus on one possible definition of the working poor that uh, this project has sort of uh, generated that type of thinking of what it means. And then finally, uh, a section on where would possible national uh, minimum wages bind in South Africa. So given the, the best available data, given our most robust assumptions about what may be wrong with the data, what, what may be underlying uh, the data, we will uh, take a look at where possible uh, national minimum wages would bind. The, the analysis here is drawn exclusively from uh, one of the working papers out of the Institute's uh, research. And it's available, uh, there's a couple of copies lying on the table outside, but also it's available on the website. And you'll see as I go through my slides, uh, the slides that draw from that paper have a page reference number in the top banner. So if you do happen to have it in front of you now, then you, you can, can cross-reference and make sure that I'm uh, actually talking sense. Uh, okay, so one page of motivation. This hardly needs to be, uh, to be uh, repeated, especially in, uh, in front of such an audience, but it would be remiss of me not to set the scene at least for, for one minute. So we know about South Africa that it's a society characterized by very high levels of inequality and poverty ever since the first nationally representative data set that we have uh, for South Africa, which is the 1993 PSLSD. Uh, we found that the, uh, any, any, any other uh, data set that we use that's nationally representative will find a high and very sticky level of, of inequality, whether that's wage inequality or, or um, household income inequality. Um, and a large proportion of workers earn low wages, right, and can be thought of as, as working poor. Quite what that proportion is depends on, on your definition, but I think in, in a very general sense, we, could, we, uh, we can see that the large levels of, uh, high levels of poverty go hand in hand with a large proportion of workers that uh, can be thought of as working poor. Uh, a question that Asgar is gonna answer or deal with a little bit more in, in his section following mine is which groups would be affected uh, by a national minimum wage? That's the first question that I'll be answering. This is the derivative of that question would be what effects might this have on output, demand, poverty, and inequality, which is another part of the research initiative and in which I'm very much looking forward to uh, hearing about after my little chat. And of course, understanding who would be affected and how the depth of the effect uh, by a potential national minimum wage, so I'm not gonna sort of choose a number and stick with it, I'm gonna present uh, a range, a plausible range, one might say, uh, and of course that is essential in the, in the developing debate. Just one little bit of, uh, Admin, before we, we get started, uh, the data sets used in the analysis, there's three data sets that are used in the paper. The first is the post-apartheid labor market series for the trends, which I'm not gonna really talk about today. The third wave of NIDS from the National Income Dynamics Study from 2012 for household welfare. And then the labor market dynamics of South Africa, uh, which is a 2014 uh, whole year uh, data set for the current labor market analysis. And, and indeed the, the third of these will form the main thrust of, of the presentation. Okay, so just to remind myself and actually uh, make breaks between sections, we now will move on to the role of, of household income in, in uh, income inequality and poverty. And we see uh, a graph that I have been trotting out for a number of years, so apologies to those of you who have heard this uh, until your faces are the same color as the, as the bottom section there. Uh, but we've got, so, uh, got you quite, something quite interesting. I know the screen is a little bit small, so at the back it might, may not be as uh, legible as, as, as ideal. But uh, on our x-axis, we've got uh, household income deciles from 1 to 10. So basically what we do is we take the distribution of household income and we divide it up into 10 equal chunks, where the poorest 10% of the population in decile 1, the next poorest in 2, all the way up to the richest 10% of the population in decile 10. So a, in ascending order. On our y-axis, we've got the share of total income. Of course, that ranges uh, from zero to 100%, so the share of income for those deciles. And what we can see here is, uh, is uh, the finding that uh, as we move up the distribution of household income, as we move to richer and richer parts of the income distribution, wages play an increasing role uh, in determining the total household income or in the share of total household income. And then that's basically a sort of a one-for-one one crowding out in terms of the proportions uh, with government grants, which make up the vast majority of income for the lower deciles 
And that crossing point between uh, the contribution of wages and the contribution of government grants occurs around about the fourth decile of the distribution. Um, and then we see, just very briefly, remit remittance income is fairly consistent until uh, we get to about the seventh or eighth decile, and then income uh, of a capital nature or investment income really only plays a major role right uh, at the very top of the income distribution. So this is just uh, looking at the relationship between uh, households' access to wage income uh, in the first place, fi probability of finding a job, and households actually that have a job, what sort of wages are being earned, uh, and we see uh, the role that that plays over the distribution. Uh, we, can, we can look at the, uh, the role of wages in determining income inequality as well. That's not part of this presentation, but suffice to say from our mid-1990s data sets up until today, almost all studies have found that the contribution of wage income to overall inequality is in the range between about 85 to 90 percent. So by far the biggest driver of uh, of wage inequality, sorry, of total household income inequality is wage inequality, and then within that, uh, the role of access uh, to wages, sort of whether a household has an access to uh, the labour market, i.e. has someone working, uh, contributes uh, about a third of that 90% uh, itself. If we want to talk about poverty, there's a long section in the paper that deals with poverty, but I just wanted to pull out this particular uh, stark table. Um, the poverty line chosen here uh, is, is a, a recently released uh, poverty line calculated by uh, Josh Budlinder, Murray Labrant, and Ingrid Woolard. Uh, Josh, I think, has just stepped out, but he did a lot of the legwork on this. Um, and that was a, a poverty line of 1,319 rand per person per month. I'll talk a little bit more, a little bit later, about how that was constructed. But for a poverty line of 1,319 per month per person, we can see that the um, poverty rates are the following. Overall, the national poverty rate at this line is about 62%. So, so just reflecting what some of the earlier speakers have been alluding to, uh, a poverty rate for a line of 1319 is 62% uh, of the South African population lives in a household in which household income per capita uh, is less than 1,319. And we can see that there's a very strong uh, racial dimension to this as well where over 70% of African South Africans live in, in households that can be considered poor, according to this line. Uh, about 57% of colored South Africans, uh, about a fifth of Asian and Indian South Africans, and under 5% of, of white South Africans. Now, presenting the numbers in this very stark way also uh, hides some of the underlying patterns. And uh, as alluded to in the first, ses uh, first session in the comments, uh, we need to think also about the dependency ratios of workers. Uh, in, in these poor households. And by dependency ratios, I mean what is the ratio of people uh, who are relying on a wage earner in the household for their well-being to the number of wage earners in the household itself. And if we, take, if we look at dependency ratios using the NIDS data from uh, 2012, we see that on average, workers who are in a non-poor household support uh, themselves plus one other person. So there's that dependency ratio of one one worker to one dependent. And if we look at uh, the dependency ratio of uh, uh, poor earners, so that is earners who live in households which fall below the poverty line, we can see that that ratio rises to, to close to three. So in a non-poor household, it's one to one. In a poor household, it's close to one to three, or one to 2.7. So that's just something else to think about in terms of the added uh, sort of uh, dimension to what, the, what is, uh, just a rate sort of table gives us. Okay. Uh, some stylized facts about trends in the labor market. If we, look at, uh, if we look at our data from the early 2000s up until about 2012, there's, a, there's a five points uh, that I wanted to bring up that will help to contextualize this uh, discussion. And the first, which was mentioned, I think, by Lotta uh, earlier, is that shares in agriculture, mining, and manufacturing have gone down. Shares of the total are employed. Uh, the shares of those, in, uh, of the, sorry, the total, the proportion of those employed in trade, finance, and services went up. So there was a sort of counter counterbalancing, uh, and there was a relatively strong growth in mean in the average earnings for most sectors. Growth in the median was a lot more sluggish, uh, and so this speaks to uh, sort of a, the, the pattern of the, the the mean growing faster than the median, and that has sort of obvious implications for what we might find 
for inequality within each sector. And indeed, the share of uh, within sector inequality contributing to overall inequality rose from about 60% to about 80% between 2003 and 2013. One more thing that comes out of the paper and comes out of the trends is that there was a downward trend in aggregate hours worked per week, particularly since 2008. It's an interesting, interesting finding, and it's something that's been found in a lot of other places before, but I'm not going to talk about it uh, anymore today. Okay, so what does the current labor market look like? Okay, this is just going to set the scene for the where will it bind section, where would a possible national minimum wage bind section. And I'm using the Labor Market Dynamics South Africa uh, 2014 data set, which is basically the merged uh, uh, quarterly labor force surveys, the four of those, uh, with the um, wage information added to them. Because when the QLFSs are released, at the time of release, they don't uh, have the wage information with them. The LMDSA basically is the uh, merged QLFSs augmented with, uh, with wage information. The composition is all workers. So I've, I've excluded the self-employed uh, from, from this analysis. And unless otherwise stated, everything is restricted to those who work uh, at least 35 hours per week. So unless otherwise stated, um, we're going to be dealing with our own version of some type of uh, definition of, of uh, a full-time equivalent. Okay, so what does it look like with our uh, approximately 13.1 uh, million uh, South Africans who, who are employed? Uh, in the labor market in 2014, we see that there's about 5% in agriculture, 12% in manufacturing, ne nearly 18% in trade, and then the biggest, uh, about a quarter of all South Africans who were employed, were employed in the services, in the services industry. Close to 10% in domestic services, uh, and we'll see that the, the first row of this table, agriculture, and the last row, domestic services, often provide uh, us with a very different picture compared to the, the other eight sectors. Of course, these are very large sectors and there's a lot of variation within each of these sectors, but just uh, to, to keep matters as, as sort of simple as I can, these are, these are the 10 sectors that, that generally are gonna form the, the, the part of the analysis. Okay, so now a, a, a table with quite a lot of information on it and a table that everyone in the room, I'm sure, can find something to disagree with uh, over here. But basically, I thought, what is, what is going to be the most uh, useful kind of information to provide to policymakers and, to, and, and into the debate? Uh, and of course, as anyone who's ever worked with data knows, you can always find something to criticize it. Uh, you can always find something to criticize, depending on your, what your sort of position coming into, the, coming into the debate is. So I've basically tried to make as many uh, possible scenarios as possible, sorry, as many scenarios as possible clear and to provide uh, the means and the medians, so the, the average and the, and the 50th percentile uh, on the basis of all these assumptions, because in the event of a national minimum wage being linked somehow in some ratio to the mean or the median, it's important uh, that we have some sort of uh, table in which we can see where, that, where, where it falls. 10 minutes, thank you. Um, so we're going from uh, what I call a naive assumption, the first row, which is going to give us our lowest mean, all the way up to uh, row 11, which is uh, probably the most controversial one, but assumes a scenario of 40% uh, uh, under-reporting of wages in the QLFS. There's a long discussion about that in the paper. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that that figure is something that is set in stone. It's just something that I believe provides us with an upper bound in, in this debate, and, where, and the naive assumption provides us with a lower bound. So we're looking at... Uh, Let's just focus on, on rows, uh, on row uh, four first. If we take workers who only work 35 hours uh, plus in a week, we'll see it, that it, there's the mean of about 8,700 and a median of 3,640. Okay, so th these are the sort of numbers we're talking about uh, in, that come out of the QLFS data. And if, if we're going to be linking to means and medians, uh, it's, it's possible that these are the type of numbers that we would be talking about. If we restrict to f uh, formal the formal sector only, uh, as, we, as we expect, given uh, that the informal sector has uh, lower wages on average, we see that our mean rises to uh, 9,809, so the average wage of close to 10,000 in the formal sector full-time only, and the median uh, rises to 4,368. Uh, so... Yeah, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through too much more, but in the paper, there's a long discussion on the merits and detractions of each one of these, of these type, of, type of assumptions. 
summary statistics of the of the uh, of earnings by industry. There's a lot of numbers here, so so hopefully the number of numbers combined with the size of lunch uh, I'll, I'll, doesn't mean that you drift off in the slide. Um, but uh, remember, this is this is now for full-time workers, so this is only for those who are 35 hours plus per week. And we see that the 90th percentile, so the earnings level below which 90% of, of earners earn in agriculture is the same as the median in manufacturing, transport, and finance, and indeed uh, the same as the 25th percentile in mining. Okay, so we're talking about some very big, uh, very big dispersions here. We can see again clearly that agriculture and domestic services uh, lag quite far behind the others, and the utilities sector, which is uh, largely dominated by workers in the public sector, is the best off on average, and services again. It, it, 25% of the workforce, it's a very diverse uh, sector, but we can see that there's, as expected, a very wide uh, spread in the wages that are earned uh, in the second last line in that table uh, for, for services. I'm going to skip over that one. Okay, so one thing that I wanted to talk about before we get into where national minimum wage would bind was the concept of, a, of, a, of creating a working poor line. So there's many different uh, definitions, many different type of international approaches to how we define uh, an, an individual, a wage earner, as being working poor, quote unquote. Thanks, I got my own water here. I'm, I'm suffering from the, from the effects of a trip to the Afar region of Ethiopia about a week ago, so I'm sorry for quite how much I'm sweating up here. Mm. So what is our objective here? We want to have some sort of threshold below which we consider wage owners to be working poor. Well, an uncontroversial definition, but maybe controversial assumptions along the way. So the central question that we ask is, what wage level would it take, on average, to bring a household living below the poverty line, which has at least one worker, up to the poverty line? So it's a static kind of question. It's not saying, if we were to raise wages, then we would eradicate poverty in working households. It's just basically saying, let's get an idea of what the labor market looks like. Let's see what the average gap between the wages that are earned, and our poverty line, what the average gap is for those workers, and let's see what it, what it gives us. So we want to take the total number of dependents into account, not just those within the household, but those who live elsewhere uh, that are also dependent on the wage earner for, for income. Um, what, then what poverty line do we choose? Potentially controversial. Uh, and we also want to take the depth of poverty into account. And here are three options for three poverty lines. Uh, we've got the one that we choose on the top, the uh, Josh Budlander, uh, Willard and, and Leibrandt line of 1319 that I mentioned before. Uh, the, uh, Burke Osler and, uh, has a line from the early 2000s, which uh, if we inflate to 2015 rands is 1,365, and a recently released upper poverty line by Stats SA of 960. If you want to have a discussion about how these poverty lines are constructed, it's quite a fascinating quite a fascinating topic, and I'd be happy to, uh, in the coffee break, chat with you about that. But basically, we get a working poor line of about, for our, for our poverty line of choice, 4,125. So 4,125, so hold that, number, hold that number in your mind. And if we look at where the, uh, where the um, what this means for, uh, working, uh, for working poverty, we can see for each industry that about 90% of those employed in the agricultural sector earn below this 4125. Uh, less than a quarter in mining, about half in manufacturing, 31% in utilities, etc., etc., all the way down to about 95% uh, in domestic services will be considered earning below this working poor line of, uh, of uh, 4125. So we can see that uh, the distribution of wages by sector is very different, and so the uh, imposition of a single national minimum wage would, of course, have a very different, a very different effect on these sectors. What would it look like? So, what's, it, what's my time? Five, four. Okay. Whew. What, uh, what? What? Where would a national minimum wage bind? So let's finally get into some graphs because the tables are starting to make me go. Uh, and what? What have we got over here? I hope it's clear. We've got a cumulative distribution function. What does that mean in, in general terms? We have uh, real earnings on our x-axis, so I've restricted it from zero to 10,000 rand per month. And on our y-axis, we've got the cumulative proportion of wage earners. Okay, and I'm gonna plot a couple of, 
uh, vertical lines for different potential levels of a minimum wage. This is, uh, so you'll see the first line that I've plotted here is 2,500. This is a sort of a thankless task because when I plot this, I'll get slaughtered by one side for starting too low and I get crucified by the other side for starting too high. So I'll, get, uh, I'll take a double whammy up here on the stage this afternoon uh, and start off by saying, if we go at 2,500, how do we interpret this graph? And now I'm actually quite glad I've got this thing. Uh, but 2,500, where this line goes up, we would say, given the data in the quarterly labor force surveys or in the labor market dynamics surveys, we would see that a line of 2,500 would cover 30% of workers. So we're talking about just under a third of workers would, be, uh, would have their wa uh, wages raised if a level of 2,500 was chosen. Um, I'll go all the way to this slide over here, and you can see I've got lines at 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, presenting this graphically so that we don't restrict ourselves to a single number. Uh, we're not, uh, in the words of Deaton, held hostage to an arbitrary line, uh, but we can at least see graphically how this effect would pan out as a potential wage was raised. So we can see from 2,500 coverage of about 30% all the way up to 6,000 where we're talking about coverage of about two-thirds of workers. So about two-thirds of workers in the South African labor market, according to this, uh, this graph, would earn uh, less than... 6,000 uh, rand per month. So when thinking about where a national minimum wage would bind in a sort of a, in a broad labor market sense, uh, this is what we're talking about. Um, here, there's, there's a lot of information. I was thinking of submitting this uh, for the next uniform for our cricket team for the T20 World Cup, but there's so many colors over here. Uh, we've got, whew, finally a laugh, thanks, guys. Uh, we've got... <laughs> We've got, uh, we've got seven, uh, seven sections here. Uh, each, each, uh, the color of each block refers to a different section of the wage distribution. So the blue is those earning less than 2,500, moving up 2,500 to 3,000, the green 3,000 to 3,500, the gold 3,500 to 4, then one up 4 to 5, this lilac uh, 5 to 6, and this sort of uh, Morocco swallows maroon is those who earn uh, 6,000 rand and above per month. <laughs> Hope I didn't offend anyone. Um, but basically, let's just look at this, and I, then I think my time is, uh, is running uh, painfully short. Um, but basically, the, the take-home this, of this is the larger the, the blue block at the bottom, the larger the relative, or the larger the proportion of workers in that particular sector uh, earning below 2,500 rand per month. And we can see that that's about 70% in agriculture and close to 80% in domestic services. But in, say, construction and trade, we're talking more about 30%. So if there were to be a, a minimum wage at, at, at a level, say, of 2,500, it would cover a lot more in agriculture, domestic services, than it would, for example, in uh, manufacturing, construction, or trade. Likewise, if, if a minimum wage, say, was set at the, at the top of the gold, which, is about, which would be at between 3,500 and 4,000, we would see it would cover about 90% in agriculture and about just under 60% in construction, similar to trade. It's actually quite interesting how similar the distributions of earnings in construction and trade are. To give you a... I'm getting, I'm getting the one finger over here. Uh, I, need a I need to retire hurt. Um, the, in the paper as well, there's a discussion on how, the, how a national minimum wage would bind differentially for the formal and the informal sector. Very important uh, question that was, that was uh, raised by Imran uh, in, his, in his opening address. Not dealt with extensively in the paper, but it is something that, that is presented. And then for those that are interested, I'll, I won't talk through it, but we've got uh, by different age groups, by, uh, by gender, uh, drilling down into finer, uh, finer industry codes, if you're interested in sort of torturing the data to the point of weeping, uh, going down to uh, the finer, finest industry codes that we can, and then also, if we wanted, wanted to go even further, within the manufacturing sector, trying to look at how different levels of a potential national minimum wage would uh, affect uh, different uh, subsections of the manufacturing sector. Uh, if you're interested, again, the paper uh, is freely available, and I'm always happy to, to have a chat uh, in, in the breaks. So 
thank you very much, and uh, I'll hand over to Oscar.